Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever Gymnastics WA StarCast live on Instagram. We're extremely excited to be welcoming a very special guest shortly. Uh, my name is Abid Imam, the Senior Participation and Inclusion Coordinator at Gymnastics WA, and uh, we'll be joined by Australia's most decorated gymnast, Lauren Mitchell, very shortly. So if we just uh, wait for a second while we get ready to go live with her, uh, we'll, she'll be joining us in a few minutes. This is your opportunity to to actually ask any questions and we'll hopefully be able to ask Lauren Mitchell for you. We've been incredibly excited to see so many questions come in over the last few days. Uh, welcome to everyone and hope that you are all safe, well and, uh, and, and, in a, and, and doing well in, during this really, really tricky time for everybody. So we've got Lauren here, Australia's most decorated gymnast, two-time Olympian, world champion in 2010 on the floor, and a multiple Commonwealth Games gold medalist. Lauren, how are you? Hi, good. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. So you can hear me well? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, absolutely. So how are you this evening? I'm all right. <laughs> Just Very finished good. work, then just did a workout, and yeah. Awesome. I've just been studying up on all the all the achievements you've had. So many papers, all the uh, all the <laughs> all the winnings, all the achievements. <laughs> so I can't wait to get into this <laughs> this conversation with you. Uh, let's start by actually going through the beginnings of your journey in gymnastics. And you were, I understand, six years old when you first had a gym bus party on the double deckers, <laughs> the, a gym bus birthday party. What was, what was your recollection of your first steps in gymnastics? Um, so basically my parents, like you said, organised a gym bus party for me. So for those people who don't know, it's double decker bus. You take out all the inside seats, you replace it with gymnastics equipment. Um, all I remember is just having the best time ever. And I have like a little slide thing down the back. I think I just did that so many times through. Um, and then that kind of sparked my interest and then I pestered my parents for months to take me down to the local club um, and see if I could actually do gymnastics. And then, yeah, just kind of did a trial and basically fell in love with the sport. What was uh, the step to your first local club like? Or what, were, what were your first local clubs? So I went to Claremont PCYC, uh, which no longer, or no longer exists. So it's where the Claremont pool used to be and now it's, a big set of apartments um so that was my first club there um and then um then college park took over that but i never actually trained at college park so i only did about three or four weeks i think at claremont pcyc then talent scout from waste came and they picked me up watched a training session and then invited me to come down and train with waste then i did the one month trial and the three month trial um and within that transitioning period or no, no, it was definitely after that, actually. I represented Claremont PCYC for a couple of years and then they shut down and then, um, yeah, College Park took over, but now College Park's up in June July. Um And, yes, there's apartments in Claremont. I love the background there, by the way. That's uh, – which leotard is that um, one? <laughs> um, that's the London leotard. So when I had my – I had a retirement party a couple of years ago um, and it was my sister's idea, actually. So got the leotard framed. And then before I put the glass on, it was just everyone basically, um, you know, who was really important in my life at the time, signed it and, yeah, ready for the next stage of my career. So I'll bring it a little bit closer there. Ooh, yeah, there so everyone's, yeah, everyone's really stoked to see that. That's a <laughs> Olympic Games leotard. How cool. Uh, yeah, it was one of my favourite leotards. I love wearing it. So that's why it's up there. Let's talk about how you got picked up by WACE. What was that process like? So WACE is the WA Institute of Sport High Performance Program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was only really six at the time, so I didn't really know exactly what was going on. Um, obviously, like your parents and stuff deal with a, a lot of what's going on, and um, I wanted to go. So I went down and um, I had a trial, and I was so nervous because, I didn't really know what to expect, but, you know, it's like kind of going to a different school and you're going to a different gymnastics club and you're wondering if you're going to fit in or um, if people are going to like you or anything like that. And, yeah, so I had the one-month trial and then had the three-month trial and then, again, didn't realise what was going on and then mum was like, oh, so 
do you want to train here for a little bit longer? And I was like, yeah, I don't want to go anywhere else. You know, I've got friends here. So, yeah, that kind of, that was the start of it. We've actually got our first fan question and we're, we're encouraging everyone to send in questions. We, we've been inundated in the last 24 hours with questions for you, Lauren. Oh. <laughs> 24, uh, Libby Jim 007, uh, who was your first idol? Ooh, so when I was training, it was definitely Alana Slater. Um, yeah, so she was in the gym. I saw her every single day and I used to train. Um, I ended up training alongside her, which is very cool. Um, and now she's one of my friends, which is even cooler. Um, and then when I was, I think it was 2004 Olympics, I was watching. Um, and Catalina Porno from Romania. She was just amazing on beam and floor and I love beam and floor. And so, and she won both gold medals. Um, so she was my idol. And then Chen Fei from China as well. Just she is she was an amazingly fierce competitor. So watching her was just awesome. Yeah. You did mention your family a couple of answers ago. Uh, I want to know how important your family support was because I understand that you had a brother that was also in the in a mag HP program. So it was like a family immersed yeah. in gymnastics. What was what was that family <laughs> environment like that was uh, really involved um mum tried to keep you know gymnastics at gymnastics and then home at home so I'm one of four so me and my youngest brother um we both did gymnastics and my sister did horse riding and my other brother did a bit of basketball a bit of, sorry not basketball baseball and soccer um so it was kind of trying to keep everyone quite active and things like that but my family were ridiculously supportive so my mum used to wake up I'm the oldest of the four my mum used to wake up um, really early in the morning with all four of us drive us all to the gym drop me off um, drive everyone back home get them ready to school drop them off to school pick me up from gym take me to school then go to work and then do basically the reverse in the afternoon um, and that was until I got my license really and then as soon as I got my license mum was like go for it and then at that time my brother was training as well so then I turned into his taxi. But without that support, I wouldn't have got to any training sessions. So, yeah, it was just kind of, yeah, without their support, I wouldn't have got to where I was. So family is ridiculously important. Something that links nicely is a question from Daniela Gymnastics, Daniela.Gymnastics. Uh, what was your approach to school study, social life, and the training balance at that time? How did you balance all those competing things? Now I don't know. <laughs> um, but at the time, it was it was what you did. So I basically, uh, when I was in year three, I think that was when I started training in the mornings. Um, so that was kind of when training started ramping up a little bit and then you really felt it when you're in high school. So when you when I went through high school, high school was year eight, not year seven like it is now. Um, and basically we were training 10 sessions a week, um, morning and night, and you kind of, you knew that you didn't really have a little, really big social life um so you tried to basically do I tried to we had Wednesday afternoons off that was basically my time for homework so I tried to smash out on my homework on the Wednesday night if I had assignments I would try and do that um after training sometimes and then I tried to use um the weekends either for social or catching up on schoolwork so um say for example we have um training Saturday morning I would have Saturday afternoon off to do all the social things and then Sunday if I needed to do schoolwork then I'll just use that for schoolwork so it kind of depending on the week to week it varied a little bit but yeah and then when we were traveling and stuff I always took school work away with me so I could always make sure that you had schoolwork and that just kind of because when you're at say a training camp it's 24 7 gymnastics and you kind of go a little bit stir crazy sometimes so just even having the schoolwork just to get your mind off gymnastics particularly if it was like a rough session or something um it was just really good for me personally, I found that balance really good, yeah. It sounds like a balance that worked really well because uh, we saw your Olympic leotard behind you from 2012, but your first <laughs> Olympic Games were in Beijing in 2008. What do you remember yes. from that debut at an Olympic Games? Um, at the time, I didn't realise how young I was, and now looking back, I was like, I was, you know, literally just turned 17 and I went to my first Olympics, and... Um, one of the, like, the most, the best thing, I guess, the best thing that I remember um, was walking into the Olympic Stadium right before we competed and you can just see the crowd everywhere and 
the crowd was going wild and um, the atmosphere is just nothing that you've ever felt before and it was just like electric and you knew that at that moment when you walked in you were an Olympian and no one could take that away from you and I think that was one of the proudest moments that I've ever felt and you know just walking around the village and you see all the other Australians there and you get all the Australians in their green and gold tracksuit and you've never met them before but you always say hi because you know that you're a fellow Australian representing Australia at the Olympics and it's just it's crazy and um, the difference between Beijing and London was ridiculous as well so um, Beijing everything was very structured and regimented, regimented you know the Chinese like all their order and their organization and stuff like that um, where London was kind of completely different so it was really good that it was English-speaking country and it was re very well organized but it was a lot more relaxed say compared to the Beijing Olympics but both were amazing and both really good yeah it's uh, it's good to start with Beijing because 20, uh, 2009 and 2010 were uh, years that you led up to winning the world championships eventually. How do you reflect on yeah. uh, on those experiences and those building blocks to eventually the, the, the big moment of winning the four world title? Um, well, after Beijing, I didn't really stop training. So a lot of athletes after the Olympics, um, they have a bit of downtime and they kind of reflect on a few things. Um, but I actually did my TE that year. So I did year 12 over two years. Um, the first year of TE was in 2008. So I kind of did that and then did a couple of World Cups straight after um, and then run into some injuries early in 2009, um, got over them quite quickly. And then the year after the Olympics at a World Championships is always individual. Um, and that was quite nice. So you had the pressure taken off you for the team events and all you had to do was focus on yourself and um, making sure that you did a good job for yourself and um, it's all about kind of that preparation. So it's a little bit different. Um, and, again, it was back it, – it was in London where we competed after in the Olympics. Um, but that was my first time in that arena and that was a massive arena and that was just amazing to compete in. And I think um, – I know the Brits obviously, you know, cheer for and support – all the Brits and the UK people and stuff like that. Um, but I think secretly when I was on beam, they were kind of supporting me a little bit too uh, because I don't think there was any um, Brits in the beam final, but then Beth Tweddle was in the floor final, so she won floor. Um, and then 2010, again, I had like a very bad um, string of injuries. So I started off, I think I broke my hand and then um, I tore my adductor and then I did something else and, Basically, my first competition of that year was Commonwealth Games, um, and the Commonwealth Games then led straight into the World Championships. So the day of our floor finals, um, so basically competed on floor, floor finals, did the drug test, came back to the village, had a couple of media interviews, the rest of the team packed all my stuff in my bag because I didn't have enough time to pack my stuff, and then we were on a plane to Rotterdam, um, which is the World Championships club. And then, um, yeah, spent two weeks there. And it was just, I think, because of that whole preparation, you're not stopping, you're not stopping, um, it just gets to the point where you just feel so ready. And I don't think I've ever felt that ready for a competition ever again, um, just because the preparation that we had was just amazing. And that's, that's what it was, because um, even though I did have those string of injuries at the start of the year, it was a really good three, four-month preparation that I had up to the World Championships, which I think made the difference. So those world championships in 2010 were in Rotterdam in the in the Netherlands for the geography buffs out there. But you were the last competitor <laughs> on the floor. Uh, what was yeah. let's let's enter your mind and how did you get into the zone for what was ultimately a world championship floor routine? How do you get into that that space that you need to be? Um. So when I um at a world championships on when you make an individual apparatus final you don't get your 30 second touch. So for those gymnasts out there who compete, um, when you're say in an all round final, you get to touch the apparatus for a certain amount of time before you then go up and compete. In an apparatus final, you don't get to do that. So you can train in the morning on the podium and then you basically just go to the back gym, there's a back warm up gym, and then you can warm up there. But then when you come out onto the arena, that's the first time you're touching the apparatus again for a couple of hours. Um, which that can be a little bit daunting sometimes, especially if you haven't done it before. So 
I was last up, which I actually really liked because then you have time to kind of go back. You can prepare at your own pace. You don't really know what's going on. Um, but anyway, so I was back there and then the national coach at the time, Peggy, came running in and I knew the calibre of gymnasts and they were quite good. There was like the last world champion, um, a previous Olympic champion and um, the current world all-round champion. Like there was some really good gymnasts that I was competing against. Anyway, Peggy comes running in and she was like, the window of opportunity is open. I was like, what? Um, <laughs> didn't know what she was talking about. But turns out a couple of the gymnasts had made a couple of mistakes and they stepped out of the floor. Some people fell. Um, so the scores were quite modest. And so she was like, look, if you just go out there and you hit a normal average everyday routine, um, you know, you could be in with a shot. And I never thought that I would be in a shot for gold. No way. I thought that I would be in a shot maybe for a medal. Um, and so I went out there. Um, and I kind of, I didn't focus on that side at all. I focused just on myself and then my job because ultimately that's all you can control. You can only control your job and what you're doing and what you put your body through. Um, and you can't focus on what everybody else is doing because that's completely outside of your control. Even the judges scores are outside of your control. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I did my little pre-floor routine that I do before stepping out onto the floor and then got in the zone. And, um, I actually thought that I ended up coming second because I read the score wrong, and then the crowd was just ridiculously loud, and I was like, what's going on? That's too weird. Um, and then I looked at the score again, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, that was very exciting. Well, it's great to see everyone's tuning in and uh, asking some questions. Please uh, please keep them coming, because we love to love to see that, and uh, you've got an opportunity to ask a world champion a question too, so we'll try to get to them as, mu as much as we can. But right now we're talking about Lauren finally winning the – 2010 World Championships floor title, which was incredible. And coming from that yeah. event, you had, an, uh, you had a actual move named after you, the Triple Wolf term, the Mitchell, I understand. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about how that yeah. was developed and the story behind it. Um, so the story behind it was we were in a training camp in Russia um, and my coach at the time, Martin, she was looking through the new code of points and there was this wolf term that, came up and it was quite high difficulty for what it was. And I started that skill on beam because I wasn't very good at turns on beam. Like I always had a deduction because I always wobbled or um, it was always going to be one of those skills that you just had to do to get the special requirement. Um, so anyway, started working this skill on beam and it was quite successful. And so at the time the double wolf turn was in the code. So a skill is named after you if you're the first person to compete at a world championships or an Olympic Games. And so on beam, you're able to do half turns and that counts as a skill. On floor, you're only allowed to do full turns and that counts as a skill. Um, so on beam, the two and a half wolf turn had already been named after someone. So I knew that if I wanted to do it, I would have to do a triple. So did that on beam first, got that named. And then um, just started working on floor and the double was good. And then um, certain competitions I could pull out the triple if it was on and then certain competitions I couldn't and I think at the world championships I just yeah it was like, I just went for it and if I if I didn't make it I didn't make it but I ended up making it so yeah I've got two skills named after me now which is cool even though it's a great skill but <laughs> what a great legacy to have for sure yeah it is very cool yeah you were known for working really really hard and doing twice as much as anyone else that's what some of your coaches would say, and I'm, I'm sure that's right. <laughs> How would you have navigated a challenge like this current lockdown for, for gymnasts if you put yourself back into your gymnast days? Yeah. Oh, this would be super hard, like keeping your motivation up, um, especially for, you know, say Georgia Godwin who got selected for um, Tokyo and then not being able to go because they're postponed the Olympics. It would be ridiculously hard. Um, but my mantra when I was actually training was, um, the success of, sorry, the sum of everything, everyday efforts equals success. And so for me, that was my mantra and that's kind of what I live by. Um, and so it, I would get myself into the mindset and be like, okay, I only have to do this today. I only have to do this today. And kind of all those little efforts, even if you're not motivated on a day, all those little efforts add up over time and they culminate and then they lead to success. And so that's what I would remind myself and, you know, remind yourself why you actually started gymnastics because you loved it and you were passionate about it and 
that never really goes away because, you know, I've been out of the sport now for three years or something like that. Um, and I still love it. Like, you know, I still love to watch it and I can still do a handstand, so that's good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, remember why you started it and keep that passion alive however you can. And it doesn't have to be every day. Um, you know, I know some of the club girls only train a couple of times a week or once a week or whatever. Um, but just try and keep that little bit of motivation going and um, get other people involved with you because that really helps as well. You know, when you've got a training partner there or someone to have your back and you can do it on Skype or Zoom or Instagram or I think we can actually see people now probably down at the park. So, you know, get a couple of friends together and, yeah, keep that motivation and keep that this passion. Means- Absolutely. This links really well with uh, a popular question that we received from a few people. Yep. It's around uh, what were some of the tough times you had in your career and how did you overcome them? And it's more around some of the key words that we're seeing from some of the questions coming in are around mental blocks. Yeah, I've seen a couple of those come through actually. Um, so probably the toughest time was when I did my ACL. Um, so that was right before Rio Olympics. So it was a year out and it usually takes about a year um, rehab to get back to full training again. Um, and, yeah, it was one of the toughest times because it was a really, really hard rehab process. Um, and there was actually a lot of mental blocks coming back because I injured my knee doing a double Arabian. So I don't know if a lot of people know what that is, but yeah, it's on the floor. So jump up half turn and then a double front to land and then as I was landed I accidentally or it was a bad landing I half extended my knee and it went pop um and so knowing when you do something like that you just know that you have to have surgery there's no way around it you can't postpone it or anything like you basically have to have surgery um and so that was really hard because then I was either gonna retire or try for Rio and trying to make that decision in a week whilst you're also trying to kind of come back from an injury and stuff like that, that was that was really tough. And then that was one of the times that um, your family's there around you, supporting you, giving their advice and what they would do and stuff like that. Um, so, again, I literally took it every single day and some days I was happy just to be able to walk. Some days I was happy just to be able to straighten my knee. Other days I did a cartwheel and I was ecstatic. Like it just every little thing and you just have to have a tiny little goal every single day. And, you know, even if you don't make that goal on that day, try the next day. Um, And then, like, with the mental blocks, it's um, particularly when I was coming back from that, Okay, and and we're talking about mental blocks, but there might be some internet blocks at the moment, so just be patient with us while we wait for Laurie to come back. Yeah, Lauren, you just had um, you just had an internet block as well as a mental block thing there. So oh, no. <laughs> just uh, track back a little bit so we can get back on that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically you let you kind of shut your mind off and you let your body do the work. And so within a skill, you have I used to have like a little key thing that I used to focus on in the skill. Um, so say for example, I was doing a flip on beam. Um, I used to have a pattern in my head that I used to say. So I used to stand there. I used to have a little spot that I used to focus on and then I used to breathe out and then I used to feel the rhythm in my head and then that really helped. And it gets to that point where you know that um, you're going to have a mental block and then you kind of have to, it's like jumping over an invisible line. You know it's going to be okay. You have to tell yourself it's going to be okay or it's like jumping into ice water. You know it's going to be really cold. You just have to do it sometimes. Um, And once you kind of just do it so many times, um, your mind starts to shut off and your body starts to think, oh, this is actually okay and you can do it. Um, So it's just finding that connection again between your mind and your body. And, yeah, Um, for me, like little keywords within the skill really, really helped. And trying to find that rhythm and the breathing and stuff like that really helped. Yeah. It was a very good question that just popped up around uh, when you're coming back from injury, what are some of the your favourite activities to do afterwards on the on the on the rehabs uh, on the rehab front? Oh, 
rehab front. Um, well, I used my injuries because we didn't get a lot of time off, so I kind of used it as a mental break a little bit. Um, and so we're quite lucky in gymnastics that if you injure your ankle, you can still do bars. If you injure your hands, you can still do, you know, some tumbling and things like that. Um, so you're able to kind of work your way around a few little things. Um, but coming back, it was, I don't know. Um, I kind of enjoyed it, I think, because you do have that mental break. Um, but it depends on the injury again with what rehab you would do. Um, yeah, so I guess the the person was probably asking about my ACL, maybe. Um, so I did a lot of strengthening work in my VMO um, and a lot of glute work as well to make sure that I wasn't bending my knee in and um, there was just a lot of strength work that I did and right, like the correct pattern movements, making sure that I wasn't going to do it again. And um, that was really mentally challenging as well because I had to, um, changed the way that some of my skills were too. So, yeah. Okay, Lauren. In uh, in some of the research I've done, all this research, <laughs> um, I did see that after the 2010 World Championships, you said that you enjoyed most complete competing on the floor, but then you loved training on the beam. So, what was uh, yeah. what were the reasons behind this? Uh, well, I love competing on floor because you can express yourself and you can play with people and, you know, give the judges little looks and stuff like that. And so that's what I really liked. Um, but I didn't like training floor because it was really hard, like really cardiovascularly hard. But you had to do that training because then you were able to be really expressive with the judges. Um, so it was kind of like a catch-22. But then on beam I really liked because training – um, it wasn't as cardiovascularly intense and you could kind of, it was quite methodical and it was quite nice. But then in competition, it's quite nerve wracking because you have to be on and, um, yeah, you do get the jitters and the jitters can show when you're on beam. So that's why I didn't like competing it. Um, but, yeah, I like competing floor because you can be expressive and stuff. Yeah, and you always get that bit of adrenaline, which really helps as well. What there was another good question. Where did uh, what were your tips for developing confidence on giants? The move, the giants. Oh, oh, okay. This is hard because I haven't done bars. I didn't do bars after London because I had a shoulder injury. <laughs> I didn't even do bars in London. <laughs> um, so confidence on giants. It's definitely like the downswings generally okay. Um, it's when you come up and it's not. So you, it's one of those things where you just have to trust yourself and you know that you're going to be okay because your hands kind of wrap around the bars, right? And even if you don't go over the top and you come back slightly, you're going to be okay. Um, and even if you go too far over, you're also going to be okay because then you can jump off the bar. Um, so it is a little bit like not holding on for dear life because you know what you're doing and you've worked on the correct pattern movements and things like that. Um, but it is a little bit like taping, taking a leap of faith. Um, so, you know, you're in handstand, make sure you're in a proper handstand. You kind of dish down until you get to the bottom and then you have your good arch underneath and then you good kick up, good kick up over the top. And I know if you're a little bit scared, you don't like to do that kick up over the top because that is kind of the sticking point for a lot of people. Um, but, again, it's just trusting yourself, trusting your coaches, making sure – well, I know that they know that you're ready to do something like that. Um, so it's definitely putting your trust in other people and then you can finally put your trust in yourself. Well, thanks for that advice on the bars. Uh, September, okay. 26, oh. uh, September, <laughs> September 28, 2016 was a very sad day for us because that was your retirement date. So Brianna T, yeah. how did you know when it was time to hang up the leotard? Um... For me, it was like a bit mentally I was tired and physically I was tired. Um, so I trialed, like I said, in 2015, did my ACL um, and then worked my butt off to get back and compete for um, the trials for Rio. Um, unfortunately, didn't make it because they only sent one person instead of a team, um, but that's a different story. Um, and then so I ended up going to a World Cup in June of that year, of 2016. Um, and then I was like, well, I'm not going to the Olympics, so I'm going to have some time off. Um, and then I traveled around Europe after the World Cup, um, had some time off and I just kind of thought, 
I've given gymnastics everything. There is nothing left on the table for me. I achieved everything that I wanted to achieve apart from an Olympic medal. Um, and I thought, you know, I wouldn't be able to stick around for another four years. Um, physically, I wouldn't be able to stick around for another four years because um, the last four, the last couple of years of my career, um, I was quite injury prone and um, it was just kind of managing all these little niggles. And so physically, I think my body had given enough. And then mentally, I knew what it took to be really successful. Um, and I knew what it took to, you know, get a medal and be at that level of gymnastics. And I don't think I was willing to do that for another four years. Um, and so when I had that month off and I came back and um, spoke to a couple of people and then that just kind of solidified my response and, yeah. It's really I think cool it was that's... really good. Time. Yeah. Sorry, Lauren, continue. Oh, no, I was just saying it was a really good decision and I think I made it at the right time for me, yeah. It's cool to see that people are saying where they're, where they're tuning in from to this Gymnastics WA yeah. Starcast. We can see... A shout-out to Esperance in Western Australia, the Twilight Aerials Club. I know Gymnastics Australia have shared this in the respective states as well and that there's people even overseas oh, cool. tuning in, so it's really cool. Yeah. Hey, everyone. <laughs> a few more questions we've got, Lauren. Um, now that we're coming into the present time, how did you, how did you set yourself up for success post-gymnastics? So studies, how were you planning for that transition? Yeah. Um, so I always knew that gymnastics wasn't going to be my final career. Um, you can't really um, earn a living from being a gymnast, unfortunately, and it's not like you know football or soccer or tennis or something like that. Um, so I knew that I always had to do further studies. And like I said before, always studying kind of gave me a little bit of an out and it gave me some, a chance to focus on something else, not just gymnastics, because otherwise I think I would go a little bit crazy. Um so I kind of, I was always studying on the side, always kind of doing it part-time and things. And so 20, so I started uni straight after my TE. So that was in 2010, I started uni. Um, after 2012 Olympics, I kind of had a shift in career. So I started doing biomedical science and didn't want to do that anymore because I didn't see myself sitting in a lab all day. Um, and so then I researched a few things um, and then I switched to Curtin Uni and I did medical imaging technology so I'm a medical imaging technologist which is just a fancy way of saying I'm a radiographer so There's still as those soon as I, retire, <laughs> yeah, well, I get to play with radiation so that's cool you know yeah. um so when I retired I had that to fall back on um and basically the year after I retired it was crack so I had to do six months of crack and so I was working part-time doing crack part-time and then you still have assignments and stuff on top of that so the first semester after I retired, I think was the highest semester that I've ever got in my marks because I was so lost. I was like, I don't know what to do with myself. I have so much extra time. And so I just kind of threw myself into my studies. Um, and then, yeah, I got the highest score. And then that's where I was on prep there is actually where I'm working now. So it kind of worked out really well. It was like a glorified job interview. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that's really important, always something to fall back on. Because you never know, like, when your time's up. I was just lucky enough that I could choose when I could retire. A lot of people don't get that option. Yeah. What are some of your interests and passions uh, at the moment? Um, not really a lot. I'm not doing a lot. <laughs> we can't really do a lot, can we? Um, but I like hiking and stuff. So my partner and I, we go hiking quite a bit around Perth and um, being down to, like, Bluff Knoll and things like that. And at the moment I'm cooking quite a bit or trying to learn different dinners and stuff and master chefs on. So watching that, I don't think it's as good as that. Like they are just absolutely ridiculous. Um, but yeah, you know, just little things that you can kind of find around the house at the moment. So yeah. And I like um, printing out photos of stuff that I've done and making little collages and can't wait to travel again because I love traveling, but you know, we are, you know, having to be in lockdown at the moment, which is fine and completely understand, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Can't wait till we... would have, gymnastics would have been your ticket to the world. All those countries you got to visit in yeah. in that time where you were yeah. competing. Got... And... Yeah, we got to visit so many, but unfortunately didn't get to see a lot. Um, so I saw a little bit, but I would love to go back to some of them one day and actually explore some of the places, yeah. 
I like that you mentioned cooking because we are sponsored by <laughs> uh, we're sponsored by Go for Two and Five Healthway, and diet is so important. Yep. What are what was your approach to healthy eating as a gymnast and also now? Um, so as a gymnast, basically whatever mum cooked because you didn't really get a chance. Um, but it was all very like pretty healthy meals. It was your standard um, meat and veg and stuff like that. And then we were only allowed treats on a Wednesday or a Saturday night. Um, so they were our little kind of treat nights. Um, when I first retired from gymnastics, I was like, oh, my God, I can eat whenever I want, whenever I want, um, which is not good. Um, so now I still, even now within myself, I still try and limit my treats just to the weekends. Um, but still, yeah, so we usually go over to Bums on a Wednesday. So sometimes we'll have dessert then and um, sometimes Friday, but it's generally just on the weekends. But I actually really like eating healthy because you feel so much better within yourself. Um, and, you know, for lunch, I'll just pack a wrap and some fruit and something else, like another little snack and sometimes veggie sticks with a bit of dip. And, um, you know, I try and eat relatively healthy still because you have that whole background of being healthy and um, loving exercise and I would hate to lose that. So, yeah, that's why I like to eat healthy because you can still keep active and I like to keep active by eating healthy as well so it's kind of they work both together yeah i've seen a bit of a theme with some of the questions around confidence and how you develop confidence uh, as a gymnast so i just wanted to go back on that too do you have anything for the gymnasts who are watching confidence all comes down to your preparation i think um so the more prepared you feel the more confident you are in your execution so when you're at a competition um so your preparation is basically your day in, your day out, your grueling um, routines that you don't want to do but you have to do. And so our coaches used to play little tricks on us, like little mind tricks. And, you know, say, for example, on beam, you either the program was five beam routines, but if you hit three beam routines, then you're okay, you're finished. So instead of being like, oh, well, it's five beam routines, if I fall, it doesn't really matter and stuff like that. Um, and so you had to hit. But if you hit three, then you were done and you didn't have to do the other two. So it's kind of like a little bonus. Sometimes it was you had to hit three. So if you f- fell, you had to finish a routine, you started again. And it was just, um, it was all those kind of like little mind games. And by playing those little mind games, then your confidence just increases that little bit more when you're at a competition because then you're like, well, I know that I can hit three beam routines in a row first time, so I shouldn't be falling. Um, and you just kind of get that little boost and, um, you know, even if you're not feeling confident within yourself on a particular skill, you can always go back and ask your coach and be like, can I work on this skill a little bit more? Like I'm not feeling confident. Um, I need to just do a couple more reps or a couple more um, kind of halves or parts of my routine just so I feel confident in this bit. And it's always really uncomfortable. Um, everyone has that skill that they hate on every apparatus. And I can tell you what mine were that everyone has that skill that they absolutely hate, but that's the skill that you have to do more and more of um, because that's the skill that's going to trip you up in competition because that's what you don't want to do all the time. So that would be my advice. Do the uncomfortable things. Simone Biles' name has come up in the comments quite a bit. (laughs) I think people want to know, (laughs) the fans want to know if you've ever competed against her. (laughs) I did. Only one competition though, (laughs) or maybe two. Um, oh, no, only one. It was only one. It was, oh, actually, maybe I didn't. I can't remember. It could have been 2000. No, but I, I actually haven't. Um, I went to do 2014 World Championships, um, and that was where I met her. So we had, like, an after party, and I met her, said hello. Um, but because at the World Championships, I rolled both my ankles at podium training, which was, two days out from the competition and I could barely walk. So um, they pulled me out from the competition. So I never actually competed against her. And then 2015 Worlds did my ACL and then 2016 Olympics um, didn't make the team. So no, I I don't think I've ever competed against her. Yeah, which is a bit sad. (laughs) Now, yeah, yeah. She is one of the greats. (laughs) 
is there a gymnast that you particularly love watching at the moment? It could be her, but is there someone else, uh, any gymnast that you would recommend young gymnasts to watch because of the way they go about it? Oh, I'm not sure of her name exactly, but there's the French gymnast that Martine um, coaches. I think it's the Santos or something. No, not the Santos. Oh, she's got a really long last name and it, I think it's Maria or something like that. Anyway, I really like watching her only because she reminds me of a younger me. Oh, um, and I think it's because obviously Martine coached me and then she's coaching her. So um, you can kind of see the similar techniques and stuff like that. Um, oh, I have to – Oh, it's a really long no, last name and it starts with a D. I can't really remember. But I think it's Maria or Marilia or something like that. Um, but, yeah, French girl, one of the good French girls, yeah. You're so adored by the fans. You can see all the messages coming in. The love hearts are everywhere on this Instagram live. <laughs> uh, have you thought about awesome. uh, about coaching or uh, what are your involvements in gymnastics at the moment to inspire the, the next generation? Uh, well, I did think about coaching for a little bit, um, but it was a bit hard with crack and stuff going on. And then um, I did mentor the waist girls for a little bit. Um, and then it was it was a little bit difficult just with the program and um, so I was doing it with Alana Slater and both of us are shift workers and then she has just had a baby. I think he's maybe six months old or something like that. Um, and so that kind of um, got postponed and then I uh, wasn't sure if the program was continuing and then um, obviously the coronavirus happened. So um, love I would love to keep mentoring and things like that because, you know, got so much knowledge that, just kind of sits in my head and it would be awesome to kind of share it with some of the younger gymnasts like I do go out and do talks sometimes for the clubs and uh, but it hasn't been I haven't done a talk for a while actually um, but yeah I would love to get back involved when I first retired I needed to get out completely because um, I knew that if I stayed in the sport I would want to come back as a gymnast and I knew that was the wrong decision for me um, mm. so yeah definitely now is a very good time where I could actually come back in and um, mentor a couple of the girls. I think you'd be a popular option because as soon as we started talking about you potentially being a coach or mentoring, everyone started to comment in saying, oh, you should come and coach at our club or you'd be the best coach. So, yeah, you'd be popular. Um, <laughs> yeah, more than happy if the coach want to contact me. I'll come and, you know, chat to them for a little bit. Uh, what were some of your favourite uh, favorite strength exercises? Uh, I don't know if I had any favourite strength exercises. I hated rope climb. And I know people used to cheat on it all the time, but um, that was one of the things that I made sure I did every day and I started on it because I hated it. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. Keep caster handstands were really hard um, and caster handstands are really hard. Um, probably my favourite one was floor bar only because I think, well, Nicolai spotted us um my other coach but I think he used it for his strength training a little bit so we didn't really have to do a lot of the work it was mainly him doing all the work um but yeah I think now because I go to the gym quite a bit now um and we do pull-ups and what's called toes to bar so it's basically like leg lifts in gymnastics and so I actually really like that because I can do that relatively easily compared to the normal population <laughs> um so yeah that's what i really like yeah uh, one more fan question it's around what's behind you the leotards how many do you actually own <laughs> oh <laughs> um a lot <laughs> uh so for example every commonwealth games or olympics that you go to you got at least five training leotards and three competitive leotards so i went to four of those um so that's at least 35 or something there. Um, and then every – so for the national team leotards as well, you've got five training leotards and three competition leotards. And I probably have about four or five different sets of national team leotards. And then the everyday training leotards was just uh, – probably had about maybe 10 of those. And then the waist leotards and the WA leotards. Um, I would say close to 100, 150. But I have, I started culling all my stuff, um, which is a little bit sad because it's kind of like the end of an era type thing. So I don't have as many leotards now. Um, so I have started throwing away. And I do disintegrate over time as well. 
So I looked at it and I was like, I probably couldn't even wear that even if I wanted to. Um, but yeah, so at one point it was probably 100, 150. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think the leotards would disintegrate if I put one on even at the first time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Lauren, we're going to do the round-off segment now, which is <laughs> uh, it's time now for the round-off segment, which is obviously a gymnastics move. But uh, the last two questions that we're going to pose to our star cast special guests. So the first question is, yep. what's the best piece of advice that you've received? Um, probably it was use your energy, like your nerves, your extra nerves that you have as extra energy. Um, and whatever way you can do that, um, I think for me that really helped. Um, so for floor, for example, um, you do get quite nervous and so you can use that to then play and um, express yourself a lot more with the judges and the crowd and things like that. Um, but it's obviously within certain limits because you don't want to have too much energy that you bounce out the floor. Um, and so I learnt this thing that so whenever I – could feel nervous I could say okay I'm nervous I've got all this extra energy and so I need to use it in a certain way and I used to stand there and I used to just kind of feel my feet underneath me so this worked really well for beam um, feel my feet underneath me and then get all that extra energy and just push it into the floor and really ground myself and be like okay I'm standing I'm on the ground I'm grounded um, I'm ready to do beam um, and this is I'm present in this moment. I'm not thinking about, you know, my routine in 20 seconds, my routine at the dismount, um, at the mount, like anything. I'm in this moment right now. I'm just waiting for the judges to give me the okay sign. And so seeing those nerves and then converting that nerves to energy and then using that energy in whatever way is really good for you, um, I found that really good, particularly in competition. Um, but and another piece of advice, which I'm going to give as well, is don't just practice it in competition because you don't know what's going to happen. It's a competition. Anything can happen. So if you want to actually use a technique like that, you have to practice it in training. So, you know, on beam, when we were doing the three beam routines to stick, you had to actually practice, okay, well, I'm feeling nervous about this beam routine and, okay, I can feel my feet underneath me. This is Okay. Um, and then you do your beam routine. So it's no point just practicing it in comps because you don't do enough comps. So, yeah. The final question on our round off for this first ever Gymnastics WA Starcast with Lauren Mitchell, the fantastic Lauren Mitchell. What is what what is your happiest moment in gymnastics? Um. So my happiest moment, my proudest moment, was obviously at. Um, 2010, seeing the um, Australian flag rise up above the Russian and the Romanian flag, that was probably my proudest moment. Um, my happiest moment, I think, I guess it's just a overall thing. It's just I got everything out of the sport. It taught me so much. And um, not only did I get everything out, I gave everything to it. And, you know, just coming out of it, still loving the sport, coming out of it, being proud to be a gymnast and um, coming out of it still, you know, being happy, being in one piece and still willing to give back to the sport. I think that's kind of what I'm most happy about. And, you know, being able to retire my own turn, making lifelong friendships and, you know, having, I know some people don't have an amazing relationship with their coaches, but I was lucky to have an amazing relationship with my coaches. And I still catch up with all the gym people that I used to train with and stuff like that. And so I think that's what I'm most happy is it's just given me so many memories that nothing else could give you. Um, sport gives you so much. And, you know, I know people are um, really passionate about other things in their career. So it could be like the environment or um, politics or anything, but sport's just so unique. And um, for us, it's so finite as well. And it's so fleeting and um, you don't really appreciate it at the time. Um, it's only kind of looking back now and you appreciate what you actually did do um and when you meet people they're like oh you went to the olympics and you're like yeah and they're like what <laughs> you're so young um and it's you know it's just stuff like that that makes you super proud and super happy and um just the whole journey i think if that's not a cliche answer <laughs> it was a that was a perfect response 
Perfect 10. Yeah. I think this whole Instagram oh, has been <laughs> fantastic. Really, really thank you, Lauren. And uh, great to see that you're, you're happy and well. And thanks to all the, all yeah. the groups as well. Yeah. Oh, no worries. And it was nice to see just everyone's comments and stuff there and all the love hearts going on and it's been awesome still to know that people actually still know who I am. That's kind of nice. <laughs> Well, thank you, Lauren, and, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. We can't wait to come back with another instalment, another special guest of the Gymnastics WA Starcast very soon. But uh, everyone, stay happy, stay well, stay positive, and eat healthy. And we'll see you shortly from Lauren and Abidima from Gymnastics WA. Good night. Good night.